going to read to you from Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 12 through 25. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there Make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. It's a somber setting, and it's a hugely important story from the life and the ministry of Jesus. This is one of those that is told in all four of the Gospels, and there is a lot of detail in each of the Gospel accounts. Before we leave this lesson, we're going to see all of the things that happened that fateful night in the upper room. Among them was the institution of one of the two ordinances that are recognized by the Baptist Church, one ordinance be, uh, being believer's baptism. That was commanded when Jesus later ascended into heaven. We do it right out there uh, in the Gulf of Mexico at this church. Chris says, we ha- I haven't run the numbers myself, Chris says that we've had a lot of baptisms out there and that we have a 95% survival rate. No, seriously, we have done it in, in the winter time. We have done it with double red flags out. Uh, we shouldn't have done that, really, but we did because those people were on a timetable and they needed to be baptized. And I got baptized again, too, uh, <laughs> when the waves were that high. One of the uh, institutions that the Baptists recognize is baptism, and the other is the Lord's Supper, which was instituted on that amazing night. First, we see Jesus telling his disciples how to find the place where they would share the Passover. And it was another demonstration here of the supernatural prophetic power of God that was working through and in him. There was a man carrying a pitcher of water. He was a servant, I'm sure, but let me explain something. That's woman's work. No, in that day and time, that was woman's work. We're not talking about carrying a big old bucket that might require the upper body strength of a, of a male servant, but um, a pitcher of water that otherwise a maid servant would be tasked to carry. So it would have been a little unusual to see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Jesus told him, that's what you look for. Also keep in mind, there would have been more than two million people in Jerusalem and the suburbs there at about that time, maybe as many as three million. They had come for the Passover festival, 
And let me tell you something. If you come to Gulf Shores during, say, the Hangout Music Festival or during Shrimp Fest or Fourth of July weekend, and you just stroll up to a condominium and say, I'd like a room, you might not find one. It's hard to find a room at a time like that. And yet, there was going to be one, evidently promised to Jesus, a large and furnished upper room. Jesus foreknew that they would find a man with a pitcher of water, or he had arranged it with a secret signal. Either way, Jesus had to foreknow a need for secrecy at that point, if it was that simple, so that the location could not be betrayed. So either way, you slice it there. It begs the question, if Jesus foreknew the betrayal by Jesus, why did he let it happen? That is a big, scary piece of unknowable stuff about God. It describes both his foreknowledge and his gift of free will. We make our own choices between good and evil, salvation and damnation as we ride along through time. But God is in the driver's seat. Never doubt that. We can jump out the window or out of the uh, door of the moving vehicle if we decide to. We can ride on the luggage rack on the top. We, we can make all kinds of choices about what we do while we are in that vehicle. But God is driving it. Never doubt that. When Peter was preaching in the temple after Pentecost, he spoke of the will of God being worked out even through the crucifixion of Jesus, through the evil choices and actions of the wicked. Act 2, verses 22 and 23, he preached, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. They rejected Jesus and unjustly murdered him in one of the most brutal executions recorded in history. The Lord's Supper memorializes the death of Jesus. He broke the bread to show how his body would be abused. It was prophesied in Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He named the cup the blood, representing a New Testament. Jesus died a bloody death. It was the price of our salvation because blood represents life. Way back in Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The evening of the Last Supper, the prophecy that one of the twelve would betray Jesus, that was gripping but how soon, even in the face of something like that, how soon, how easy is it for us to lose sight of what is central? How easy is it for us to fail to keep our eye on the ball? We get distracted so easily. On one hand, you can see why Jesus chose these men to be his apostles. They, they weren't asking each other or accusing, is it him? Is it you? They asked Jesus, is it me? They were pretty humble men. That's a humility and an honest awareness of personal sin and doubt. It's the reason why so many people prior to Jesus were getting baptized by John the Baptist for repentance of sin. But on the other hand, Luke recounts just how brief their humility was in that moment and how soon it gave way to something else. Luke 22, verses 24 through 30. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are also called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is the greatest among you, 
let him be as the younger, and he that is the chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is it not he that sitteth as meat? But I am come among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And I think it is at that point that Jesus decided he needed to teach them a lesson in a way that they would never forget. John, in his old age, remembered it vividly in his gospel, chapter 13, verses 3 through 17. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean. But not all, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. We must never forget, when we are tempted to pride the example of our master, humble enough to take on the chores of the lowliest of servants. It was a lesson never lost on Simon Peter, the natural leader of the disciples, the first leader of the infant church in Jerusalem, his rock-like faith and courage, his love for others, his acceptance of Paul, his tolerance for Gentiles, his personal integrity, his humility to admit when he was wrong, would successfully guide the church into two millennia of faith and discipleship. But on the night of the betrayal of Jesus, Peter was not yet the man of God he would become when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Luke tells of this in chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, 
I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Peter was, even before being filled with the Holy Spirit, a a bold man. Jesus was stern with him at times, though he loved him. And there was another disciple there who seemed to be as much a man after God's own heart as even King David, and far more innocent than David. Young John was easily Peter's equal, or perhaps even his superior in faith, if not in boldness. The question of who would betray his master now occupied the mind of the big fisherman again, and John had reason to remember it very clearly. John 13, verses 23 through 26. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And remember what Mark added to that prophecy. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. Matthew tells us in 26.25, Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. John continued in chapter 13, verse 27, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him, for some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. When Judas left them there, forsaking Jesus and heading out into the dark, The countdown of the crucifixion began. Jesus, with all the foreknowledge that God gave him moment by moment, did not panic. He didn't get into a hurry. He didn't get into a rush or a frenzy. But he did begin to make the best of the time that was left him. The traitor was gone. And now Jesus began to teach his final lessons to his true disciples. John 13, beginning in verse 33. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, And as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, That ye love one another as I have loved you, That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, If ye have love one to another. It's still the mark of Christianity to this day, isn't it? We do not let politics or anything else divide us in our love for one another. Even when other Christians in this church are in such calamitous error that they disagree with me, I still love them. And thankfully... We are blessed with such fine brothers and sisters that even in their terrible errors, somehow they love me too. 
This love for one another is the surest sign to the world that we are sincere and true believers and followers and students of Jesus. The word, juice, uh, the word that Jesus uses here that we translate as love is agape. It's not the eros of romantic passion between a man and a woman. It's not the philia, which is the affection between old friends. It is not the storge of family affection. The Greeks had a lot of words for love. It makes a speaker of English have to use a few more words to describe it. Agape is a charitable and a benevolent love. It is the highest form of love that seeks only good for others without any thought of return. It's an unconditional love that does not depend on how others treat us. It is shown in how we treat others. It is not simply an emotional response. It is a determination. It is a thing not just of the heart, but also of the mind and of the soul. It bears insults and injuries. It maintains goodwill even toward enemies. It is a God-given ability to love people that we don't even like. And that's very important in a Baptist church. Oh, you could have laughed at that a little bit more. Jesus knew we would need that kind of love and that we couldn't have it without the help of his Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural love that can come only from God. When people see Christians gathered together into a church of people that have this kind of love for one another, then they see the love of God. And they cannot help but feel that these Christians truly are disciples of the living God. When we love one another like that, people know Jesus is in our midst when we gather in his name and we love one another in this way and we seek out what his word can do when it lives in us, then we become more like Jesus the whole time. And that was just the first part of a great flood of teaching that Jesus would impart to them in that evening. Once upon a time, a long, long Long, long time ago, way back in the 1900s. Some of you remember the 1900s. <laughs> I was a young man back then. Um, I was visiting with my grandparents upon an evening. My grandpa, Wayland, was a Methodist minister. That's why I get to joke about the Methodists. I know all about them. <laughs> in that uh, particular time, he was dying of cancer. He had been a, a mighty man in his day. Uh, in fact, back in his reprobate days, he once broke a man's back. He ran moonshine. He was not a good fellow. But then he found the Lord, and he became a minister. But at this point, he had, he had to retire. He had lost most of his sight. He was slowly becoming infirm and racked with pain continually. And shortly after this particular evening I speak of, he had a, uh, a life-ending seizure. But they ignored the do not resuscitate orders and brought him back two or three times. He was never the same after that. He <laughs> had lost some of his mental faculties. But that was still to come. That had not yet happened on this particular evening. I stayed up with him, talking, mostly listening. It was almost as if he somehow knew that he would never again have a chance to speak to me while his mind was still, still just as keen as one of those knives that he got sharp. I've never sharpened as not a knife as sharp as my grandpa could. There are a lot of things I haven't done as well as he did. Well, bedtime came and went. Midnight came and went. And finally, about four in the morning, after talking all night, he became weary and talked out and was ready for bed. And I just took it in. Um, a lifetime of wisdom and reflection about his ministry and the things that he had known. And I didn't think a 
thing about sleep. I didn't realize how much time had gone by. Um, I'll share something with you very quickly from that evening. I remember that the old Methodist minister there was speaking about how many adult Methodists would come to him desiring to be baptized. Even though they had been christened as an infant, um, they just didn't feel like it was the same thing. So he would baptize these adult believers, even though that particular church believed that having some water sprinkled on you when you were an infant was fine. Well, we Baptists don't think that. We have our own ideas about believers' baptism and how that should be done, and you ought to know what you're doing when you do it. That's what we think, and that's what he came to believe. His experience in the kingdom was at variance with the teachings of his denomination, but you know, the things of God are higher than the dogmas that we have gathered through history. That night was a gift from God to me. My grandfather would never again be able to share so much so deeply, and God had me there that night to hear it all. On the particular night that we're studying, some 2,000 years ago, the disciples who loved Jesus were there for his last opportunity to teach them and pray for them. And Jesus gave them, it's recorded in the book of John, four profound chapters worth of teaching. One sermon after sermon after sermon could be preached from that night of teaching from the lips of the Son of God. I think I've got time to summarize it for you. And by summarize, I mean these are the bullet points. I'm not expecting you to remember them. I just want to convey them to you because sometimes it's important in the course of studying the sheer magnitude of the wisdom of God, it's sometimes good just to, just to get a big picture forest view of it. I don't want you lost in these trees, but look at this forest. In John 14, he preached about heaven would be their reward, that Christ himself was the way. He talked about the power of prayer. He talked about the coming of another comforter, the Holy Spirit. He talked about the fellowship that they would still have with Jesus after his departure. He talked about the teachings that the Holy Ghost would bring to them. He talked about the peace that they would have in Jesus. And he conveyed to them a certain cheerfulness in his own destiny as he was headed for the cross. In the 15th chapter of John, he talks about abiding in the vine, how we have to live in the vine that is Christ. We are branches of that and we have to live in that. We can't do it all separately off on our own. We all have to be a part of that great big vine together. He talked about the love, the greatest love that a man can have who will lay down his life for the love of others. He talked about the hatred that the world had for him and... For us, he talked about the Holy Spirit some more. In the 16th chapter, he talked about why the Holy Spirit would be needed. He promised again that he would send that comforter. He promised he would visit the disciples after his resurrection. He promised he would give them peace once again. He told them he was just returning to his father. He wasn't going there for the first time. He had been there before from the beginning. And whatever troubles that they would have, that we would have in this world by virtue of his victory over sin and death, Death, we could have peace in him. He prayed and talked about peace over and over again. In the 17th chapter, he, he prayed for himself and then he prayed for those that are his. And that includes us. Read the 17th chapter of John. He's praying for you and for me. He prayed that they would be kept. He prayed that they would be sanctified, becoming more like him in the spirit of God. He prayed that they would be united and he prayed that they would be glorified. Then we return to Luke's gospel just before they set out to hear Jesus finally telling them that they had to be prepared physically for the world. Luke 22 verses 35 through 38. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that 
hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this is written, and it must yet be accomplished in me. He was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Then, as Matthew records, this time of teaching was at an end. Matthew 26, 30. And then he sang a hymn and went out into the Mount of Olives. Their fellowship was concluding with an act of worship. For all they knew, they were leaving to camp out under the stars, uh, crossing the Kidron Valley, going to the Garden of Gethsemane up on the Mount of Olives. And there was a lot of teaching for them to absorb that night. Their last night together with Jesus was a gift to them and to us for the rest of their lives and for the rest of ours. The lesson here is that we need to set our lives to learning the lessons that Jesus taught that he thought were so important in the final hours of his ministry, that final night in the life of Jesus Christ, the lesson of his love, and most especially of the love that we must have for one another.